it was really going to be my last like try at this, you know? It was such an endeavor and it was, it was so much like risk involved and it was so personal that if I put my name on it, it would have to be really good. In 1989, a 13-year-old with a denim jacket in Hollywood, California, had an idea. Mike Amiri combined a love of his neighborhood's unique culture with a gift for creative problem solving and a vision for the future of luxury, creating the most explosive new fashion house of the 21st century. Fueled by twin obsessions with craftsmanship and continuous evolution, Amiri has grown his namesake from an assortment of six items to a global brand that generates a third of a billion dollars in annual revenue. And it all started with one idea. How did your parents' professional life inform your professional ambitions? Both of them immigrated here from Iran. And my dad, you know, did everything from being a waiter to a bartender to like joining the US Army. My mom kind of stayed home, took care of us. But um, there was never like a moment of like my dad not doing something. He had like a laundry list of jobs and he like did every single thing. And I think that's one thing I kind of pulled from him is the thought that you always have to be doing, like just don't like be idle. My biggest early supporters are really my family and my friends. When you're starting out something and you're dreaming really big, you're gonna need to remove all voices of doubt from around you. Having all these people who just keep encouraging you along the way will make all the difference. What gave you the confidence to pursue a career in a creative field? Growing up, you're trying to figure out like what your thing is and like what your like superpower is. I knew certain things that I was good at or more inclined at and things that I was terrible with. But every time it kind of went across something like creatively or where like imagination was involved, I felt like I saw things that like other people couldn't really see that easily. You had your first swing at creating something in the fashion space when you were 13, augmenting a jacket with the Motley Crue t-shirt. Yeah. What was the inspiration to even sit down and try to do that? Yeah. And also, how did you figure out the process? I grew up in Hollywood, and during that time in like the 80s, Sunset Boulevard was like a different place. I would always kind of see the kids out there and the way they dressed. and their jackets were patched up or they'd be augmenting their own clothing and creating their their own aesthetic, you know? So the first thing that I thought of doing was, yeah, let me grab a t-shirt, vintage one, uh, Motley Crue and like make a jacket out of that. And the simple way to do it was just kind of fit it into the seams perfectly into a Levi's trucker jacket and couldn't sew. So I paid my friend like, you know, 20 bucks to have his mom <laughs> tell me his mom sewed and she sewed it for like 20 bucks. That was like the first thing I made. So you mentioned growing up in Hollywood. You know, when you think about being in LA in that era, in the mid eighties, what are the sort of most lasting legacies of that experience on your personality and your creative output to this day? Hollywood was an amazing place because you not only had like music, but you had like culture. So kids were like, skateboarding, BMX, graffiti culture was like huge. And I was so young that things didn't really look raw to me. They looked like really beautiful. So I would walk down an alley in Melrose and although it's like filthy, there'd be so much art by all the graffiti crews and I would just be in awe of how beautiful the colors were. You went to Beverly Hills High yeah. at a time where everyone from Angelina Jolie to Alchemist was attending. What was the creative energy like in that little microcosm? Yeah, so there was like a time in my teenage years where my parents like wanted us to move out of Hollywood. 
to kind of just put us in a better surrounding. So um, they moved into like a small apartment in Beverly Hills just to get us in the zip code. And it was a bit of like a culture shock, but there were a lot of like kind of creatives there and people that were, were really ambitious. Lots of people uh, whose, whose parents had done really big things. So they were like really big thinkers as well. When you get to the end of high school, do you have any sense of what you want to do as a career or where you want to go with your life? No, like towards the end of like high school, I was maybe bottom of the class, like worst student there. And it was more just because I was like just constantly distracted. You know, I, I, I had uh, still have uh, ADD and it always kind of kept my brain wandering. I'd always kind of seen it as like, oh, this guy needs extra time on tests or something like that, right? Um, but later in life, I kind of like realized that's like a superpower in a way. It's like you're just ultra creative. Your brain is constantly going and, and I eventually learned to embrace that. I do sometimes get creatively blocked when you're required to come up with so many things on such a rigorous schedule. It's natural for you to find yourself in places where you're not inspired. It's important to remember that the best ideas are usually effortless. So when things get blocked, I realize maybe I just need to step back a little bit and then reapproach it when I'm a bit more relaxed. So you get to the end of senior year and you apply to go to college. Yeah, so I went to uh, Santa Monica College and at home I was dabbling in music. Um, I, had, uh, I had bought like an MPC and an ASR 10 and I was really into like making beats and, and, and making music composing. What was the music you were listening to? Because obviously, based on the collection and also a lot of the interviews you've given, there's clearly a deep connection to sort of that 80s, you know, hair metal, LA rock scene. Yeah. But if you have an NPC or an ASR 10, I'm imagining you're listening to some hip hop as well. Yeah, the, the, the funniest thing is like, the entry into like rap music didn't start till I got to Beverly Hills because all the kids in Beverly Hills were listening to like Cypress Hill. And I was really being exposed to like that, where everybody in Hollywood was listening to like rock and roll. I really started like diving into there and early Gangstar stuff and started to get kind of obsessed with like, like the LA like rap movement. We had, you know, the far side and like hieroglyphics and Dell. There was something about that I really loved and that storytelling element, you know, to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then I, I just I just love like the the creation process, like the sampling and cutting things up, and that was like something I was starting to be obsessed with. So yeah, so I started making music for a bit. And so you're doing that while you're going to school. Did did you have any real sort of sense of purpose or intent with the college part, or was that sort of just to placate your folks? Yeah, I think like the college thing is like you do what you think you're supposed to do. And just that seems like a logical thing, you know? Um, but it wasn't like an obsession. And I knew I didn't like find my like thing, you know? Mm -hmm. I did kind of persevere and stick with that. You ended up going to UCLA eventually? Yeah. Ironically, like I was a really good student there. And what, um, what was the switch? Um, I, I realized I can work harder than anyone in the class. I realized like I, I probably couldn't understand things like as well and as fast but I knew that I could stay up later and study like longer than, than, than anybody. And I, I became really good at just obsessively trying to be like top of the class. From there, I went into law school. Were you seriously thinking, this is what I want to do with my life? There was never a flash like I was in the right place. Okay. I think like even being in, within like law school, I never had the feeling like I was in my element. You know, I, I just kind of like, persevered through it, but like I was never at the point where I was like, oh yeah, I'm a fish in water. Did you end up taking the bar and that's No, by the time I, I graduated, like I was already like obsessed with, with fashion. But before that happens, you get more immersed in music. You end up through a very strange twist of events, being a pioneer of K-pop and Korean rap music. Yeah. How does that happen? It's pretty weird, right? Um, <laughs> one of my best friends at the time was, was Korean and, and he was, he was really into music and he wrote music and he rapped and, um, English was his second language. 
Okay. So it was really difficult for him to rap in English. Um, but he was, he was still decent. At some point, the, the thought came to, you know, why don't you try doing this in Korean? Um, so I started to kind of work with him and, and, and make the music with him a little bit. Eventually it found like success in Korea. It was like so new for, for someone to bring like hip hop or rap in the genre when they were really into like techno. So it was, it was completely kind of out of left field, but the timing was like really good where it was very, very fresh. So it kind of gave me the opportunity to make music with him, uh, produce music, write music, sometimes perform music. So after five years of, you know, pretty robust success, you decide to pivot and come back to the States. What inspired that decision? Um, I think at the end of the day, it's like when you're making music in a different country and especially like within the Korean music industry, it's like a whole set of rules and you can't really control any of those variables. And there was, there was something about me not being able to kind of understand that industry and participate in there that just wasn't really fulfilling. Knowing when to pivot is really important. For me, the best ideas usually come from somewhere organic and natural. So when I move along, sometimes I have to ask myself, is this the original organic motivation or am I chasing something? And the second I feel that I'm chasing and not moving naturally, I step back and I pivot. So you come back to LA, having enjoyed some success and sort of seen what achieving something in the creative field feels like, how do you pivot from there into getting involved in fashion? You know, my entry into fashion was really just out of chance. I was hanging out with one of my buddies and he pulled out a jacket and he's like, hey, I made this jacket. It was like a recycled, like military jacket and you know, a few patches, few this and that. And he's like, I made a bunch. Do you, you wanna try to do this with me? It's pretty fun. And we eventually, you know, uh, did a brand together a small brand, and it sold to a, a store in, in LA called H. Lorenzo. We didn't know anything about business or margins or manufacturing or production. You know, we just kind of knew how to make cool stuff. And I literally hung out at that store every single day. And that in some ways was my fashion education because that store in particular bought tons of Japanese brands. You know? Okay. So they had, you know, number nine, uh, Mihari Yasuhiro, uh, Julius, Diet Butcher, like all these amazing brands that are crafted incredibly. And I just used to just kind of look through and see how they would do their pockets or their sleeve lining or their proportions and, and all those things. And I started to kind of study in that way. And that, and that really kind of was like my first education, mixing that with just kind of learning through trial and error. And how are you supporting yourself during this period? I was still like with my parents, like trying to make a little extra money. I worked at Guess. I worked at Brookstone. I had two jobs doing that. I had a telemarketing job at the same time. I kind of I kind of did everything I could to kind of keep doing that. It wasn't even like working to make it a big business. It was kind of working to do more of that. Eventually, like I started picking up like freelance projects. I was going to say, how did you start to create that network where you start getting tapped to do freelance gigs? This was like 15 plus years ago. The opportunities were really different and the landscape was really different. I was doing like trade shows in anywhere from like Vegas to Paris where we'd show at um, Trinoy. And I'd go there and there'd be like 50 brands and you have like a 10 by 10 booth and you're, you're trying to explain your brand to, to stores internationally. And, you know, those kind of things. And then you start getting to know people. And just that like process itself, you know, kind of put me in touch with more and more people. And at, at some point I was like the guy who knew how to make, you know, good stuff out of Los Angeles because out of LA, we don't really make suiting, tailoring that well. We make denim, we make jersey, we make things that like touch water. And I loved craft. I loved embellishing things and, and making something really special and stand out. And how um, are you picking up those skills? Fortunate enough for me, the law school I was in was in the fashion district. So I would just kind of leave class and, you know, go through the various um, buildings and find different sewers. And you can literally knock on doors and this person does embroidery. And this person's a pattern maker and this person does this. And there's a wealth of knowledge you could pick up in each little uh, studio. 
The most important idea I've ever had is really that failures and disappointments are just illusions and the real variable is time. So if you could move forward without fear of failure or disappointment and do as much as you can in such a short amount of time, you'll continue to learn and grow. So you start getting these freelance gigs and so you're consulting, helping people that want to fabricate locally basically? Yeah, like at, at first it just started as like freelance small things like this person wants to start a handbag company and it grew into like smaller projects um, to consulting like small brands to like bigger brands in LA that were come, come here to like the, the wash houses or whatever or some of the big denim brands. Um, I would do like freelance consulting, freelance product development. And I would kind of like pretend I had a big agency. And it was really <laughs> just me. So they're like, yeah, design, you know, these 15 things. And I would be like, all right, sure. And I would come in with like a rack of just like 30 things. And they were like, everybody's jaw would drop because they'd have like nine designers in there. And they're like, how many people are on your team? How did you make this and this? And I'm like, oh, we don't, we don't talk about the studio too much. And, but it was really just kind of me, like just making it work, you know? Not everything I made was good. I made so many like really bad things. I went down every mistake. You know, that freelance time like let me make things um, and learn on other people's dime in a way. So at what point in this journey were you able to quit the nine to fives and really fully become someone who works in fashion? I think there was a time when I like first started having kids and you know, you have a family so you have to start you know, taking things a little bit more seriously, you stop thinking about like next year, you think about the next 10 years and what that looks like. And I had been freelancing and starting small brands here and there. None of them really like took off. And there was a thought that I really want to, you know, give it serious, like 200% mm -hmm. to see if this is really like for me and like fully kind of commit because uh, up to then I was just kind of being creative and, and doing things like day to day, but there was no like big giant picture. I think by the time I had my third kid, we'd saved up enough money and I was working on a project in my head that I started to make little things for, which would end up kind of being Amiri. It was just kind of based on the premise that luxury goods and that thought of luxury and exclusivity is a destination for a goal that not a lot of people try. So instead of kind of just chasing, you know, like middle of the road things, I love to make special things. And um, if I just put more care into the materiality and the fabrications and, and the thoughtfulness, and then uh, was able to have a platform to display those, it would be hard to kind of deny it. So I designed the first collection for Amiri in a basement in Hollywood. Where did you get the startup capital to sort of get that ball rolling and produce that first collection? Yeah, we had saved up between like me freelancing and everything, we'd saved up like $30,000. You and your wife? Yeah, and, okay. yeah. And since I did almost like everything, um, I didn't need like 15 people to put together a collection. And I guess this is kind of where a little bit of clever and like strategy came into place. Instead of me walking into the store, I just had a few friends, like each one knew the buyer. And I'd say, do me a favor, just mention this brand to them. Don't make a phone call, like don't, don't like try to connect us on the phone, just, just mention it to them. So like someone would be like, oh yeah, there's this brand Amiri, it's, you should look into it. And they're like, oh sure. Then a week later, somebody like, oh, by the way, there's a brand Amiri you should look into, you know? And so many different touch points. By the time I made the phone call, I got in touch with the buyer. I'm like, hi, I have this brand Amiri. She's like, I've heard of your brand everywhere. You know, as the idea of the brand comes into focus for you and you're putting together this collection, at what point do you settle on using your name as the brand and, and how did you think about that decision? It was really going to be my last like try at this, you know? I had a bunch of false starts leading up to it and you know, being 38 years old and carrying a sewing machine into a basement with like the oil spilling on you, you know what I mean? While your other friends are like in 
law school, medical school, and professionals. It was such an endeavor, and it was it was so much like risk involved, and it was so personal that if I put my name on it, if I put my last name on it, it would have to be really good because my kids are going to have that name. So naming it something else wasn't really like a thought in, in my head. Fully invested in the brand that bore his name, Amiri kept a singular focus on elevated executions and immediately saw explosive growth. Not content to rest on his laurels, the designer and founder would push the Amiri brand beyond its core offerings, but soon would look to new partners to fortify the next stage of the business. So you get the collection in Maxfield. Obviously they are gonna merchandise it on the floor and whatnot, but did you have any other sort of strategies around marketing it or creating audience and demand? If you got into that shop, other shops around the world would call you. And when they would call, I would say, oh, I'm sorry, we're exclusively at Maxfield. They won't allow us to sell anywhere else, which is actually not true. I was not <laughs> exclusively there, but it just sounded better. After years of like trying to convince somebody in your booth to buy your jacket or your sweater, to say no was even more powerful. You know, it made buyers want that product more. So I took that year and instead of trying to sell like a bunch of things, I just kept refining the six items I had. What were those six items? I was a pair of jeans, uh, t-shirt, flannel, leather jacket, hoodie, literally my hit singles on a record. You know, it was the foundation of what we eventually built into Parisian runway shows. It was great because I got to focus on making them better and better and better and also like understand the audience a bit more and understand like really my own creative direction you know so it was really an intense focus on on those that really helped and it went from a small rack in between Rick Owens and Carol Christian Pohl to a big rack to a bigger rack to two racks to three racks on the men's side you know, for, 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 for a certain year, it was like the highest volume of that entire store. And by that time, I had said no enough to enough wholesale accounts that I got to choose where I'd want to sell. How are you managing, because you're also not only creating all of this, but you're also the CEO and you're running the business of, of this. How are you managing the cash flow side of things? Thankfully, I had a pretty good deal with Maxfields, okay. um, where they would they would pay like a couple weeks after, and also like you have to understand like the rent on a basement is not expensive, you know. Uh, family works for free, so <laughs> you know. And I I ran most of the production myself. And as I said, like the one thing I taught, learned from my parents is like, don't overextend yourself, you know. Remember like you're fallible. So I always kind of kept this distance from. Um, pushing the finances to a point where we couldn't breathe. After that first year of just selling to one store, we had like accounts around the world waiting. And the, this is, the decision was not to open a hundred accounts and be everywhere and, and explode. Uh, the decision was to pick the best in like every region and sell to them at a really like limited quantity because I never wanted to be back in the position where I'm trying to sell someone something. I always wanted to be in the position where I created something really good and I can dictate how much is in the world. I used to believe that my personal success was really dependent on so many outside variables. And over time, I really came to learn that it's really your belief in yourself, your ability to show up consistently and then present something of quality that can be timeless. Around this time is when you introduced the uh, MX1 Moto jeans, yeah. which were explosive, to put it mildly. Sometimes it just takes one thing to be your like pillar. I think every brand has that like one thing. You can call it like your hit single that every concert they're gonna want you to play that song or whatever it is, regardless of how much you love or don't love that song anymore or whether you've progressed on, 
And for me, it was uh, denim because it's one thing I didn't have to make in Europe. I could buy the best denim in the world. I can wash it in the best place to wash denim other than, you know, Japan, California. And I could be part of that process. I've seen you talk before about very purposefully sort of throttling the growth of the denim business to keep everything balanced. And I'm, I'm curious, in these moments, you're making these decisions both as a creative director and a designer, but also as a CEO who is dealing with payroll and has a staff and, yeah. and all of these things. So how were you sort of threading that needle? The important thing to know is that regardless of how well something is selling, you have to keep evolving and like, of course, respecting where you come from because I still love making denim. I still think we make incredible jeans. I like really stand by it, but I don't think it's the only thing we're great at. So it took a lot of discipline to say, okay, we are not gonna do this much of this um, and we're gonna keep expanding into other categories because Aesthetics and fashion will come and go. But if you create a brand and you protect that brand, it can last through every cycle of trends and fashion and things like that. Maybe there'll be a year people will, will wear baggy jeans or they'll go back to skinny. It won't matter because the brand is strong and we've, we've protected it. Um, so not letting the audience dictate everything you make and trying to chase, you know, that one thing can really ensure your longevity if you are, you know, disciplined enough. So the brand begins to explode, although you are tempering that growth as much as possible. Mm -hmm. How long was it from that initial capsule to the place where you felt like this is reaching that, that virtuous cycle of where the snowball is rolling of its own volition and I feel confident and comfortable that the money's coming in. I think for me, there's like never been a moment of like comfort or this thought like, oh, we made it. I don't go to sleep with that. I go to sleep with like anxiety and uh, I'm not doing good enough and I probably should have done more and I could have done better is probably like how I'm just kind of cursed to be, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, there's never there's never been a moment where I felt comfortable, um, like it's kind of on its own thing. It's always been, wow, this is way bigger than it was last year. In 2019, you end up taking on your first round of investment from OTB, mm -hmm. Lorenzo. Going into it, what did you feel like were the pros and cons that you were weighing? And then being now on the other side of it, how, how does it feel? When you're starting something like independently, it's like you're playing literally with your own money and your own life really. And I kept taking the profits of the company and putting them back into the company. Yeah. And it can be a scary thing for an entrepreneur, you know? And it's like your friend at the, at the, at the blackjack table where you were, his buddies are grabbing you and being like, dude, just go take the money and like, you know, go, 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 go to your room or whatever. And I was like the friend that wouldn't leave like the table. I just <laughs> feel like I could win every hand. But there, there, there does come a time where the business is so massive that you have to think whether you need help strategically, you need uh, help uh, with infrastructure, or you need capital. At that time, we were talking to a few different people and uh, OTB was great because I had made friends with uh, the founder, uh, Renzo Rosso, who started you know, Diesel back in the day. Mm -hmm and he's just like an uh, independent, um, started from nothing, ended up, you know, uh, owning a, a luxury group and he was a product guy and the kind of guy you can like have like a beer with. We were able to kind of uh, figure out something where I could still kind of control my own company um, and he could be there if needed. And so you were able to sort of de-risk yourself and take some money off the table and then also have this support system both strategically and financially for yeah, the brand. I think I think the most the most important thing um, was really just kind of having some a mentor that you can kind of call. Yep. That's built something really enormous from nothing. 
Yeah. Where I was going to just say, where, where have you activated that, you know, sort of most pointedly? Um, I think right now on on the retail side, on opening our first stores, um, being a brand that's this new relatively, and opening your first store on Rodeo Drive during COVID. It's a bold, bold move. Yeah, it was it was a really bold move, and I, I, a lot of people were like, "You're you're absolutely crazy." You know, there's no independent brand on Rodeo Dr Drive. You know, there's no single designer since like the only, the only two Americans there are Tom Ford and, and Ralph Lauren. You know, so that's really ballsy. But I also knew it's where we belonged. You know, seeing our brand perform in the context of European luxury throughout the world, in every account we were top two or top three. Like, why would I not? put my own store next to the European luxury also. We ended up opening that first store and it was the highest revenue store on our block per square footage the first year. With his brand's ascent from upstart to heavyweight complete, Amiri turned his attention to crafting a long-term blueprint that would defy passing trends and achieve the lasting impact of the fashion houses he revered. And as the company reached maturity at light speed, Amiri could also reclaim a work-life balance and invest in becoming a mentor in order to inspire and educate the next generation. Twenty nineteen, twenty twenty, and into twenty twenty one, there was an aesthetic evolution within the brand. My observational hypothesis is: you know, you start the brand in a very mid eighties rock-centric vibe. Yeah. And in that period, 2019, 2020, some more of your far side hip hop influences start to sort of bleed into the brand, and whether it's the footwear and eventually some of the cuts of yeah. the, the pants and stuff. One, was that a, a conscious move on your part? And two, given how celebrated and revered the silhouettes that you had created were, did you have any reticence to, you know, shake up things that were already working. If I was trying to build a big business, I would have done more of the same, you know? If I wanted to build a good brand, I would evolve it. And I, I really chose the longevity of it. And I think that's one of the things about having like the brand as my own name. There has to be like a sense of like personal integrity there. and since the decision was to kind of expand the silhouette and expand the conversation and work on different archetypes of who my heroes are. Maybe in the 80s was uh, an inspiration for, you know, skinny rockers. Maybe in the 90s it was an inspiration for skate kids or artists. I think pigeonholing yourself is sometimes like one of the worst things, you know, you can possibly do. I wanted Amiri to represent a lifestyle that was true to me growing up in California, me being a part of music and skate culture, and you know, creating heroes based on what I knew and what I could relate to. My ideas usually come from a place of solution, of creating something that I feel should be there that doesn't quite exist at the moment. You started as a bit of a renegade within fashion. And, you know, by 2018, 2019, you're being nominated again and again for CFDA awards and eventually showing in Paris and really being embraced as a darling within fashion. What was that journey like? And where do you feel like you fit into that world today? It's pretty tricky, right? Because the brand started with a good deal of commercial success, uh, which is great from a business standpoint. But artistically, it makes it more difficult for you to prove yourself when you're selling hit singles, right? For me, it was never really to gain the acceptance of the establishment or anything like that. You know, that's one thing that I was kind of strict with is I'm not doing this to, to get anyone's um, stamp of approval, you know, except for the people who are like supporting the brand. I do want to become so successful and to propose something so compelling that those institutions really at some point have to be like, this is legitimately, you know, good and either 
we embrace this or we look irrelevant. From day one, the brand has been wildly successful commercially. So how do you judge the ROI on the multi-million dollar investment in a Paris runway show? A lot of things are like context, you know? Virgil had this thing that he would do, did it once on like a Zoom or something, and he was like, this tin can, you know, if you see it in the garage, it's like a piece of trash. And then if you see it in a museum, you know, it's a piece of art. I always like related to that kind of thought process. And those big runway shows and those kind of platforms are really important for, for us and the growth of the brand. Because it's a week of you see the best in the world show, you know, specifically in, you know, in, in the menswear weeks. And you get to see them all alongside of each other. And the brand doesn't look like a startup from LA. It looks like a heritage brand with a history the point of view with the perspective, because it is. It's not in a basement anymore. It's in a um, giant garden in the middle of Paris. What are the qualities about yourself that you hold on to the most tightly? The conviction I have in moving forward and achieving my dreams while still maintaining the humility I had from starting with nothing. What do you think your biggest strength as a leader is and, and what is something that you continue to work on? I think my biggest strength as a leader is probably my ability to lead from the ground floor. Like I've never seen myself as someone who is in a different room than mm -hmm. my team, you know, coming up with things and, and doing that. If you're doing the work, we are doing the work together. You know, they're, they're won't be a time where you're here on a Saturday and then I'm not here on a Saturday. I, I think that's always been my favorite part of what I do is working with people and showing them that I believe in them as much as they believe in, in me and what we're doing, you know, because then you're really like working from the heart. I think any creative who makes something really substantial and in some ways bigger than themselves has that thought of, their connection to it. And I never want to feel that we're so big that I'm not in the garage. And, and that's really helped me stay connected to what we started with. There's plenty of Saturdays where I'll just come to the studio with, with my dog and no one else. And I'll work seven hours straight doing exactly what I was doing in the basement. And as long as I can kind of keep that energy going, I'll still feel really connected to what we do. There are so many different facets of this business that you touch and engage with as a creative and as a business person. What parts do you get the most satisfaction from? I recently brought on like the, our for CEO here, and I, you know, stepped down as CEO like like a like a month ago, you know, because I've just come to the realization that in order for what you do to be good, you have to care about it and you have to be happy. And in order for you to care about it, you have to enjoy doing it because it's really hard. It's a terrible job, and I would recommend it to nobody unless you feel like you're okay suffering through every part of it because you love it so much. For me, that part was really just the creative part of um, imagining things in my head and, and making them come to life, whether it's a sneaker or a runway show, you know? That gives me the most amount of, of, of pleasure. And I think that's where like my full potential will lie. You've talked about having a family and that sort of creating a catalyst for urgency around, you know, putting putting both feet in and committing fully to the vision of making a Miri what, what it could be. But being a creative also requires 
a, a certain amount of selfishness. And being a father and a husband requires a certain amount of selflessness. How do you maintain that balance? The one thing to really kind of consider for anyone kind of going into this business is you're going to have to sacrifice a lot of time and you're going to have to be like really selfish with your time. And people will pay the price of your disappearance, you know, and you're gonna miss a lot of things. You know, the first four years of starting this company, I missed so many things with my family and, and my kids. And it was difficult to kind of make sense of that because every real successful entrepreneur I talk to, at the very end, they're always, I'm always asking, well, what did you think on your career? And they says, oh, I missed the time with my kids. I didn't get any, you know, or I, I, I wasted it all, you know? And I was like, man, you didn't really catch a W then, did you, you know? And that's like this common thread between a lot of like older successful people that I've met. And for me, the moment I had a chance to kind of bring people in to kind of alleviate some of those responsibilities and I can carve out more time with my kids, I did. And the best part is, is that now my kids are really kind of as much into the business as I am, you know, they come to the fashion shows, you know, they're curious about every store. Um, they have a sense of pride in everything that we do. And um, it's like almost like uh, the time that I took away from them, I kind of gave back in a gift of that pride. Money really is just a means to an end. What's truly important are your values, your friendships, your relationships, your experiences. All those things should derive from somewhere natural and organic, never from the pursuit of money or anything materialistic. As we approach the 10th anniversary of Amiri, mm. you've uh, accomplished an inordinate amount, more than many, if not almost all, in the space that are your contemporaries. What do the next 10 years look like for the brand? I think that the next 10 years is really evolving the brand more into a world where it's not just kind of items of clothing and it's, it's more of something non-tangible where Amiri kind of represents a spirit or a lifestyle that connect back to California and being a teenager in Sunset Boulevard or a skater or, you know, dreaming, you know. There's two really big rewarding things about what we've done. One is building an amazing business. And two is building a template for the next Mike Amiri to see that you don't need to just sell your t-shirts on your website. You don't need to just sell to a couple stores and make a little money. To that point, in 2021, you launched the Amiri Prize, which is sort of a scholarship of $100,000 that you invest in a young designer. What was the auspice for launching that program? The Amiri Prize was really created to help foster undiscovered talent that traditionally would not have an avenue to be on the map, but not to do it in a way where here's some prize money and, and, and good luck, you know? It's not just money, it's understanding, it's strategy, it's knowledge of how to use that money because it can go really fast if you don't have a plan. So the Miri Prize is very different from anything else because not only do you get $100,000 funded by us, you also get a personal mentorship with me. And then you have access to every C-level and every manager in Amiri in my company. I want there to be more of us. I want there to be a generation of brands coming out that are new and that present something new because the whole industry really is rewarded from, from these new ideas kind of getting a, a platform. At this point in the business, you obviously have a extremely deep investment in your product, but you also have to manage a team, you have to manage your investors, 
and you have to manage your customers. Is it ever okay to compromise mm. in order to sort of sate the most of these different masters? I don't think it's ever okay to intentionally compromise. There are gonna be things you wish you did better, but to say like, I'm pretty sure this is not gonna come out good, but let's just do it anyways, cause it'll sell, is like the worst thing you could possibly do because that starts the beginning of you not caring about your brand and what you created. And that bleeds into everything you make, you know, moving forward. You can't have an inch of doubt or second guessing, you know? And when I was at that kind of basement stage and I have the three kids and there's not the luxury of thinking twice about anything, you know? To be really successful, you have to be irrationally and audaciously and have a conviction of something grand without a doubt though. It, there can't be that thing because then you're gonna get shook. So for me, when I made that decision that this was going to be that big and, and we were gonna be successful, there was really no room for anything else.